So hello, um, my name is Jaden. Um, I'm going, I'm very excited to be interviewing Dr. Sosa Johnson today. So let me open myself. I am a third year bio major at UC Irvine. I am also a first generation student as well, who is also aspiring to become a physician as well. So this is very exciting and I'm very honored to be interviewing um, another doctor as well. So I'm going to allow Dr. Johnson Johnson to introduce herself and get started. Well, thank you very much for, for the warm reception. I apologize. I have a little bit of a uh, voice hoarseness, but hopefully happy to be available and open to any questions that you might have. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So my first question is, what does being first generation mean to you? in terms, it's such a broad question. So mm -hmm. can we narrow it down just a little bit? Yeah. So in yeah. terms of so, uh, being the first to go to college, in terms of, um, so which one? Um, I guess, well, being the first doctor, like in your family, like first, first doctor, first doctor degree, how does that mean to you? Well, um, it means that there were a lot of people um, who were there supporting me. Mm -hmm. um, one does not one does not become a professional or um, one is not able to pursue further <clears throat> avenues of education unless there are people mm -hmm. there to support you. For me, those were my parents, and um, they were both um, what you'd call blue collar. Uh, my mother was a laundry presser all her adult life, and my father was a gardener. So my mother had a second grade education from Mexico, and my dad never went to school in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, but they're but they're both my role models because they taught me um, what you can do with hard work. You can support a family, right? And you mm -hmm. can um, um, do what you can for your kids. Um, you don't always understand what your kids are going through in school because you don't have that. Um, experience yourself so that makes it harder for you as a child knowing that you can't get your parents support <clears throat> but um, other people can come in then and, and take that role of uh, uh, supporting you through those steps and for me it was a lot of my teachers Mrs. Bryant from third grade and Mrs. Shoemaker from sixth grade you know I can go on and on mm -hmm. um, all the different teachers that were there to support me the educational aspect of my journey and in particularly in high school, um, uh, one of my very strong mentors um, was my English teacher, Mrs. Palmer from Santa Ana High School, because I'm, I'm locally bred, as we say, locally grown mm -hmm. from Santa Ana mm -hmm. High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was the first one in high school <clears throat> to share with me or to ask me, you know, where I was going to college. And I said, I'm not, I don't know. I've never been, this has never been discussed with me. Um, and it's one of the things that I think as first generation students, I don't think it's done purposely or with any mal intent, but sometimes we get overlooked. And sometimes people forget to ask us, where are we going to college? Now it's a lot better, a lot better because they start doing that, I think in elementary school. You know, I remember mm -hmm. my kid who was now 16, his table, there was a Harvard table, a Yale table, a Stanford table, you know, so all these different tables where they sat. So when that was in first or second grade, so they get introduced to the idea of college from a very young age, right? Yeah. But for my generation, that wasn't that wasn't that much, and so <clears throat> it didn't. It wasn't until she asked me um, where uh, if I was going that I even knew that I could, um, and I didn't even know that I had the qualifications if I wanted to. That had never really been discussed with me, but because of her assistance and guidance, I realized that a there were schools in the area that I could go to and be without knowing it, I had all the qualifications, but who knew, right? Who knew that I had mm -hmm. all the qualifications to apply to um, college? Yeah. So first generation for me means that a lot of doors are open for you. Um, a lot of that comes from other people helping you. Um, and then you become the role model for people who are your cousins, your friends, your parents' friends, their children. They get to see someone who is going on and first you're in college and then they hear that you're going to medical school then they hear that you got into medical school then they hear that you arrived right so i think that's <laughs> what first generation means to me is that you get to be a, a front runner in a lot of the obstacles and challenges that those of us who are first generation um, go through and we mm -hmm. can turn 
we can then be there for other students and provide for them what people who surrounded you and helped you provided for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my next question. So imposter syndrome is very real. We have all experienced that a bit during our journey to education and even for you possibly going on into medical school. So my next question is, <laughs> what was your most distinct moment of experiencing imposter syndrome throughout medical school or even now as a physician? And how did you overcome that obstacle? Great question. It's real. We all go through it. I think those of us who come from backgrounds where it wasn't something you saw in your everyday existence in your mm -hmm. everyday landscape, right? And so you were the first one experiencing the success of um, getting through college and then the success of getting into a graduate program. And I do distinctly remembering that first year of medical school thinking, what am I doing here? And who let, who let me in here? And boy, they made a mistake. And what were they thinking, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. and you suffer from that because, um, it bring down your morale and it can make you feel like you're not doing well. Um, and then um, other factors um, can come into play, which we can talk about other factors later. <clears throat> but in terms of the imposter syndrome, it's not till I realized one day, and the best way I describe it is this. You're with another group of students and they're all telling you that it's not a big deal, that they're, they're not studying that hard, that it's... Um, uh, you know, that they're mostly out there hanging out in the sun, throwing Frisbees and doing this. And, and you don't get it because you're, you're in that library every day from you know, eight to eight <coughs> or after you've been in the lecture room and you're out there busting your um, little behind to, to try to get everything. So you don't get it. Why is everyone working less hard? And for me, I finally figured it out that I was a psychology major in undergrad. So yes, I took all the undergrad courses for pre-med. That's true, I did, and I did well, and I succeeded. But I wish someone had mentored me and told me, that's not enough, not enough. You can be a psychology major, which I love being, but I wish someone had mentored me to take more upper division courses. So when I arrived at medical school and I saw you know, biochemistry didn't just throw me out of the water because I'd never seen it before or some other course, right? Um, that was new for me completely, genetics, for example, those kinds of things. So I wish someone had mentored me. So if someone's listening out there and you're pre-med, but you're another major, economics, history, art, you know, art history, um, business, go ahead, be that degree, get your pre-med stuff out of the way, but do some more upper division courses. So by the mm -hmm. time we get to medical school, it's not such a big surprise. I always felt like I had to work harder, much, much harder just to get the basics because those were the first time I was seeing it instead of the second time right? um, that some, some students had done it. So that would be one way um, to overcome some of that anxiety and insecurity of you know, the courses. Um, and then later I use this imagery with students that I talked to about medical school. I say, imagine there's a lake of ducks. There's a whole bunch of you ducks out there and you're one of those ducks. And everyone is gliding comfortably along and they're all chit-chatting, talking to each other, whatever. And so everyone seems to be doing just so well and no one's stressing. But, and so they look like they're not doing a lot of hard work. But then I ask you to look under the water and I bet you that every single one is doing this. <laughs> right? They're all paddling really, 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 really hard. Yeah. Some of us are better at not showing that up here. And we look like we're not working that hard, but underneath, you better believe it. Every single one of us is working hard. So yeah. don't be hard on yourself. Don't feel like you're the only one. We're all working hard, but we're just better. We're just different at being able to show people that stress above the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And so give yourself credit for the hard work that you're doing. Realize that you're just working as hard as everybody else. Um, and realizing that, you know, those of us that come from first generation families, um, have other factors that we have to deal with that a lot of our counterparts don't. And a lot of that has to do with our own family involvement, our own fam familiar responsibilities that we bring with us. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say it's baggage because it's not baggage, but it is a different burden that we carry with us even when yeah. we're in graduate school. And we mm -hmm. still need to deal with that in graduate school. Yeah. While others may not. Mm -hmm. that's so speaking of family, how was it when you told your family and your parents that you were actually going to become a physician? Because the first generation, obviously, like our families may not know what it's like to go to college, what it's like to go to medical school, what it's like to apply to medical school, be a medical student. 
So how was that experience for you breaking that all down to them? And I guess, what was their like reaction? Well, first it was convincing my father that I could go to college, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a Latina, first girl, right? Um, no one knew what that was. No one knew what that meant. Um, when I discussed that with my father, the first thing out of uh, that he said to me is like, no, you can't leave the family. We need you here. You're not going to go away. And like, mm -hmm. oh, but I want to go to college. <laughs> You know? um, <clears throat> and my my dear papi, he was like, yeah, but you know, you're probably gonna get kind of guy, you know, be in a relationship and you're probably gonna quit, right? And, and unfortunately that's still some of the thoughts more I think for women than men, right? And I'm like, and no, so first you have to convince your family that you're not, that even if you find a relationship, which is wonderful, you're still gonna meet your own dreams, right? And carry them through, but having a relationship won't um, deter you from that. So that's number one. You have to convince your family, in this case, of the patriarch or my family, that yes, I could go to college. But the compromise was that I had to go to a nearby college. So I couldn't go away. I got into UC Davis, couldn't go away because that's you no. Know, and I'm from a family in a, in a generation where if dad said no, dad said no. That was it, mm -hmm. right? We did not question that. Different now, but in my generation. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, when I told him about Pitzer College, which is one of the Claremont colleges here in the city of Claremont, um, it was only an hour away from home, right? And <clears throat> I could come home on weekends if I needed to, and I was still close enough in case the family needed me, right? Mm -hmm. So that was okay. So I could go away. And so I'm very, very glad that we found that compromise at Pitzer College. It was just the most amazing experience of my life being in college there. And so then when I said I want to go to medical school, it wasn't such a big deal because I think he, he had at that point had, had accepted that um, going beyond what I had done was going to be okay for me. And yeah. he accepted that and then the family supported me and they just were rah, rah, you know, go to the next step, rah, rah. So it was more the initial resistance initially just even just to go to college, but the rest wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, that's good. So as a physician, there are many specialties, many specialties, surgery, pediatrics, cardio, everything possible. What was your indication that made you want to become a internal medicine um, physician? It was the last choice. Because mm -hmm. um, my first choice was I thought I was gonna be an obstetrician gynecologist, but that's what third year medical school is all about. Right? You get to figure it out by doing all those rotations, what your personality is, uh, fits better with and what you want to do um, with your, with your skill set and, and just how you fit in. And I really, really thought I was going to be an obstetrician gynecologist, but I realized when I was in there one day at 3 a.m. in the morning with the chief resident and we had just done a C-section and, you know, we were cutting through and I looked in there and I went, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> I go cutting, cutting like in there. No, <laughs> I remember thinking that to myself. But of course, keeping a very straight face out here, right? Going, oh, this is exciting. This is great. You know, as you're cutting away, uh, the, the act of bringing a, a baby into the world was beautiful and wonderful, right? But the actual work involved in doing that, cutting and opening things and seeing organs, no, that was turned out. I didn't have the stomach for it, and I didn't want to do that, right? Yeah. I didn't know until I was actually there mm. doing it. So we, we find yeah. out those things, right? Um, different from when I did my pediatric rotation <clears throat> and Ramona Weaver to this day, I'll always remember her. She was my pediatric resident. And uh, I remember um, the day I knew I wasn't gonna be a pediatrician um, because with this, we had this newborn that came in, I think about two months old, the mm -hmm. fever, right? And we had to find an access, an IV access to provide antibiotics because it came with high fever. And we had to propose the baby. And I don't know how many times we had tried to, you know, to get blood from this baby, put an IV in this lady. I really thought, oh, poor baby's in cushion, right? All the different mm -hmm. number of times that we had gone in there. It felt horrible. And then out of nowhere, I started crying because the idea of having to put another needle in this tiny little body and cause pain to this little, this little thing, I couldn't handle it. I just, it was too stressful for me. Mm -hmm. So I started crying. And I remember Ramona coming up and says, together more here. I don't have time for this. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time for you breaking down for you to be having a, an emotional breakdown here. <laughs> yes, it's hard. Yes, the baby is, is is challenging, but Martha, we need to find an access. We need to do it. We're responsible. So get it together because I need your help. Yeah. Like, 
okay, Ramona, Dr. Weaver. <laughs> and then she said to me, because if we can't find an IV in the next one or two, she goes, we're going to do an intertrochanter, interosseous um, access and IV infusion. I go, wait, 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 interosseous. Hmm. I mean, in the bone. And mm-hmm. so I said, are we really going to, like, she goes, we are going to get the trochanter and we're going to stick that into the bone marrow and the anterior tibialis. If we oh, can, I, wow. I, I, I think I, I, I prayed to God right there so I wouldn't pass out. <laughs> I thought, I'm gonna lose it here so yeah she looked at me like Martha <laughs> yeah uh, I, I said a quick prayer up above dear god please find an IV in this poor little baby mm-hmm. um I mean I said a couple of those prayers up and you know and so with the scalp was the one she did and she got it yeah oh thank goodness so she got the scalp IV and you know we all took a deep breath and I think I turned around and I knew I'm not doing this there's no way I can never be a musician. <laughs> the the uh, courage um, yeah. and, you know, the motivation for a pediatrician, I just, uh, I respect them so much because of what they do and what they have to do to little bodies. I just don't mm. have that fortitude. I don't have that that uh, personality because I, I would, again, I'd be crying about every single time I had to stick a baby or do something to a baby because <laughs> at least an adult, yeah. it can cause you pain. I don't want to. It's mm-hmm. not what I want to do, but at least I can say, I am so sorry you know, can we just work with this, work with me, you know, and they're looking at me and I'm looking at them and there's a connection there, right? So yeah. I feel like I can, I can cause you harm. But I can yeah. apologize to you. So anyway, so that was for sure not. Um, and then when it came, when I realized that OB was not going to be the thing, it was already the spring of my um, fourth year when, and, you know, you have to start applying, right? That summer. Yeah. I'm like, oh dear, what now? And then I remembered, I remembered my very first rotation. I remembered internal medicine, which is my very first rotation. That's very dear. And I remembered the impression of the patients that I worked with. And I remembered um, Jerry, let's call him Jerry. I remember walking into the room where Jerry was as a third year medical student, seeing him secluded in a room by himself, in a corner, in the shadows. Um, Somehow finding a way to talk to him and speak to him and connect with him. Somehow being able to have him trust me um, after a few times because I was his medical student for that rotation. Mm-hmm. You know, getting to know him, getting to know his medical conditions, hearing his suffering, hearing how lonely it was for him because he was HIV, he had AIDS, and hearing a story about <clears throat> how lonely it was to be in this room by himself because nobody wanted to be there because everybody was afraid to be near him, everybody was afraid to touch him, and it was just so lonely. Um, and he had been an aerobics instructor. And at that time I was very much into aerobics. Um, Mm -hmm. so we had a lot to talk about. And, uh, I remember that connection. I remember how important it was for me to talk to him. I remember the ease at which we had conversations and I, and I, and I thought, you know, um, that's, I do that. I like that. You know, I like speaking, I like getting their stories. I like finding out who they are. Um, and somehow I have um, I have a sense that I can do that fairly well, you know? Yeah. And it's not something that I really would have said about myself, but all those experiences in internal medicine my third year really helped to see what my skill set was. Um, mm-hmm. Being able to talk to people, having them open up, having them share, having them share private things. And it's a very, it's a huge privilege to be given um, by another person, another human being, and mm-hmm. to connect with them. <sighs> At times that they're very, very vulnerable, um, alone, and sometimes you you can be that person that that, that bridges that for them, right? So mm-hmm. it's really amazing. And he left me a wonderful gift when he was discharged from the hospital. He had a kind of a set of aerobic tapes that he left me. He says these are for you, Martha. And so that wow. I remembered that conversation, and then I said, okay, that's me. I'm in film <laughs> <a decision." laughs> Yep, exactly. That's what I'm going to be. And it was the right decision for me. Yeah. So you mentioned that you felt like you had a sense in medicine and that your patient care was really well. What was kind of like, what was the first indication that you knew that I'd have to become a doctor? Like what clicked, what sparked, what made you realize that this is what I have to do? And I want to make sure that this is possible for me. So if I understand you correctly, you're asking me about when I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. That answer. I've never <laughs> been able to answer that question. Really? I, I don't know. 
No, not in, there was no no specific thing, no one event, no one in, no one incident where I said, uh, "This is why I'm going to be a doctor." Mm -hmm. I think I might have shared with you that from a young age, I've always felt spiritually mm -hmm. that my mission in this life was to be a doctor. Yeah. So it's my mission in this world and. Um, it comes from a source that I would just say above, you know, whatever I'm spiritually centered, other people might have different centers of, you know, what is meaningful to them. Um, but that's where it comes from. It comes from that connection that I just knew this is what I had to do in this world. Um, yeah. But it, I always felt it had to come from somewhere else because otherwise, how does the daughter of a gardener, how does the daughter of a laundry presser go to medical school? Mm -hmm. It, it, it's doesn't happen. So there are other forces I think at play. Um, and the only other way I can answer that, my aunt could answer that if she were here. Um, I was at a conference once um, that was being led by a family practice physician where she was telling the story that all of us must have that one story where we know mm -hmm. what we're gonna do. And for doctors, it's that one moment where you wanted to help somebody, where you wanted to do something for somebody, where you wanted to aid in their, in their healing of some kind, they're injured or something. Um, and so I, and I felt like, wow, I never had that. Gee, what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> there was, it was, it was a seminar. I was already a doctor there. I said, gee, how did I get here? You know, cause I don't remember that one story. Right. Yeah. And so I thought, geez, okay, fine. Um, and then she proceeded to, you know, then the next part of her, of her, um, conversation with Wes, she says, and some of you may not know, and that's okay. I go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> some of you may not know, right. Yeah. You don't, you don't remember. She goes, but I bet she says, if you ask someone in your family, they will know a story about you that mm -hmm. told them that you're going to be a doctor. Yeah. So I was curious about that. And then I remembered, boom, my auntie, if she were here to tell you, will would tell you till you were, you know, so you told her to stop telling you um, mm -hmm. that she knew that I was going to be a doctor because when we lived in Mexico until I was four or five years old. And when I was still about four years old in Mexico, um, she says, that my, my grandmother would do cloth dolls and she would, you know, do the cloth dolls um, and, you know, put clothes on them or whatever. And she says that my cloth dolls were always in a bed. My cloth dolls were always sick. My cloth dolls, I was always taking care of or poking them or giving them medicine or making mm -hmm. sure that they're okay or talking to them. Are they okay? And she says that you would always tell us that you, when you grow up, you're going to be someone that takes care of people who are sick. I don't remember. I was four years old. <laughs> no knowledge of the story. Of it yeah. comes second hand, right? Um, but she she has told that story since I can remember. Yeah. And so I was it was I was glad to know that there is a story that someone knows about me, and that's mm -hmm. and that's how we know <laughs> I was going to be. Oh, a wow. doctor. <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> so as we slowly settle down the interview, I want to ask like. Couple more, like two more questions. More, more of like the lighter side. Um, what was your favorite part of like medical school? Because like for me, like as a female, I was like, oh, it's so hard. You're studying for like eighty hours, three hours a week. Like, where's like the fun? Like, what, like what was your most normal part of medical school? That for you, that was like, fun and exciting. Academically, it was anatomy. I mm -hmm. loved anatomy. Yeah. I loved the way UC San Diego did it. And that mm. we named we named all our cadavers, and mine ours was Annie, and it was made <laughs> out of respect, so that when we uh, you know did our anatomy sections and everything, we were always doing it very respectfully, knowing that a body had been donated for us to learn. Um, yeah. So it was it was a wonderful experience to do it that way. So that was my academic experience. I really enjoyed anatomy, and then of course later my clinical years, um, as as unprepared as I felt for the science years. The, the two years, because I always felt like I was always behind and always, you know, <laughs> I had to work harder <laughs> than everybody else. Uh, in third year, I thrived because it was about people skills, talking yeah. to people, breaking it down, making sure they feel comfortable, making sure you, you build a relationship. And so from that point, I just, I just thrived. So it was wonderful. Um, but in terms of actually having fun, of course, you're going to have fun. You have mm -hmm. all these friends that you're making, all these great friends. You know, you're going to be having meals together, dinners together, hanging out yeah. afterwards. Um, we had a tradition um, that after every big exam, we all went dancing. We were out. We're out in the town <laughs> dancing somewhere. 
And there's yeah. a whole group of people that you went out with there. Confetti, I think it was in San Diego. I don't know where it was, um, but it was a place you always went out. And I'm, I love dancing. It's one of the things that um, I love the most. Can't sing, can't do, can't dance, can't do anything else. You don't, need to do anything. <laughs> you don't need to do anything to dance. You just have to love to dance just yeah. because you love to dance and not because you have any moves or special training, but you just let it flow, right? Mm -hmm. um and so we always went dancing to confetti after yeah. exams and and your friends went with you and um you know you'd stay friends afterwards these are some really incredible impactful um experiences that you share together and uh and if we're lucky we get to stay friends with them you know later on in life so mm -hmm. you will have fun. it's it is hard work <laughs> have fun. but with hard yeah. work comes hard play right mm -hmm. exactly so another question I have is sort of like, how did you balance family life, your personal life and everything like in medical school? Like how, how did you say organize it? Like yourself, your own wellness, your own wellness, but then for your family as well. How did you juggle that um, in medical school? Because you went to UC San Diego, right. which is like an hour and a half away from like Santa Anta. So how was that for you? That like adjustment? It almost did me in. Mm. So what I share with you now is to let other people that are going through that if you go through this, it's going to be okay. It's all right, you know? Um, and a lot of the big um, transition for me was finding a way to tell my family how much I love them, but to mm -hmm. leave me alone. Mm. Because I was, I was the firstborn, the only daughter, I was the peacekeeper. I was the problem solver for my family. College, not a big deal. Semester system, you can do what you need to do and you mm -hmm. can still do really well. In medical school, no way. The amount of data, the amount of information, the amount of things you have to learn is, oh my gosh, until you go through it, you won't know. You won't yeah. know. And I began to do poorly, me, straight A student, great GPA, never failed in my life at anything, you know, miss, miss overachiever. We, you know that you're probably one yourself, right? <laughs> so right? Yeah. I know you are. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I wasn't meeting my potential in medical school. Yeah. I began to have difficulties first, the first year. Yeah. And, um, Dr. Oxman, her biology was my mentor. Called me into his office and he said, Martha, we have to talk. You know, you've, you failed an exam and, uh, and I don't understand why, because I look at your grades. I look at your MCAT, I look at your GPA. This should not be happening to you. So what's, what's going on? I thought, oh my goodness gracious, finally someone is going <laughs> to ask me about the pressures of what I'm dealing with at my home, yeah. and my family. I thought, whoa, finally I get to get it out and someone's going to help me, right? Yeah. No. You know what he said to me? What he said to me. I know there's something going on that I don't need to know. Whoa, mm -hmm. tough love, <laughs> and it's, right? Tough love. Yeah, literally I'm tough looking love. at him going, what? You know, he's like, I don't need to know because you know. You know what it is that's keeping you from excelling. You know better than anybody else what it is. You better fix it. Yeah. You better fix it. He goes, because if you don't fix it, you're not gonna succeed and you're gonna fail out of medical school. Whoa, those are like chilling words down to my bone, right? And then he said to me, and he goes, it, and he goes, and worse, let's say you don't fail. Let's say you make it through. But because you weren't here 100% because something else was keeping you from learning, from solidifying all this information that you have to learn, and you learn it haphazardly, it doesn't really anchor in your person, then God forbid later on you're taking care of someone and someone has a poor outcome. And you'll never know if that poor outcome was because it was going to happen anyways. Nothing you could have done. You did all you could. You did the best you could. And that poor outcome was going to happen anyways. Or was it because you weren't here 100% and you didn't get at all the information that you needed to get to be the person and the doctor that you want to be? Yeah. So you know what you need to do. He goes, I give you two weeks, maybe three. Come back and tell me and tell me if you're staying in medical school or if you're going to drop out. Oh, wow. Whoa. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe oh, that? Wow, that's man, that's tough love. That's really tough love for real. You say you really exactly right. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! 
So I knew the problem. He's right. So I called a powwow. I called my family. I had them walk them down to San Diego. We all met in my little apartment and we had a powwow. And I told them that for the first time in my life, I was struggling academically, that I, this was new for me. And it was very disturbing and earth shattering because it wasn't the, the way I learned for the most part. I'd always done really well. And I said, and I love all you guys, you know, with all my heart, but you're the cause. I said, because you keep pulling me back. Keep yeah. pulling me back for my studies here because you need something for me at home. Something goes wrong. Something needs to be solved somewhere. You, know, you, you re reached out to me too often. And I have to, because I love you guys, I will do it. Yeah. And my studies will suffer. And they have suffered because I failed this class. And I'm so glad in, in retrospect that it happened that very first year. It happened those very first few months, right? Mm -hmm. Because immediately I could address it and immediately I could put attention to it. If this has happened later on, I don't know. I might've failed too many times that it might've gotten to me in my spirit, my person, you know, whatever. But because mm -hmm. it happened so soon in the beginning, um, the stressors of being this other person for my family were immediately brought to light. But I think it, it was, um, again, it's something that had to happen. And so yeah. I, you know, to this day, People, I remember one person I was telling a story to, and I heard one person say, oh my gosh, she divorced her family. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought about it that way before. I go, yeah. I did divorce my family temporarily, right? Yeah. Um, and I just said to them, so don't call me if things are falling apart at the house, if you can. Now, if someone's in the hospital, call me. If someone had a, you know, uh, an accident, call me. If someone's in jail or going before a judge, call me. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, made it, I put all these things, but if none of those things are happening with your life threatening and could help, you know, have poor outcomes, please yeah. figure it out yourselves. Mm -hmm. Please try to come some terms to yourselves. Please mm -hmm. try to problem solve. And I said, please don't need me so much. Yeah. As if you continue to need me that much, I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that right now. I need you to please love me and let me go. Mm hmm. That was probably the hardest conversation I've ever had with anybody, because until that point, when you've been that person for your family all your life, it's hard to say, let me go. Yeah. And yet you have to, if you want to be able to focus on all the time that you need to focus to make it in medical school. It is incredibly the most labor intensive thing you will do. <laughs> the hours that you put into that, don't compare, you know, with what you have to do. Yeah. So, you know, it took, it, it was not easy going. It took, it's, you know, start and start, start and stop. But eventually, you know, they got it. And eventually yeah. they were able to, over the course of probably that half a year, eventually, you know, we were able to fill a compromise and a balance where, yes, I would tell them when I was available to come home, I would say, tell me the important dates that are coming up. Is there a quinceanera? Is there a wedding? Is there a birthday? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Let's map out the year, you know. Yeah, I'll map out the year, yeah. Let's map out the year and let me let me <laughs> let me see what's happening and then I will tell you if I can come and you know and, and it was surprising that it took a lot of thinking and planning to let them know I still love them. I still yeah. want to be a part of their life. They will always be a part of my life. There's you know, I'm, we're still here together. It didn't hurt us, you know, we're still still each other's lives completely. Mm, but for other students that might have that heart that time, you're not alone. And you're not the first one to go through that. Others of us have gone through that. And I want to promise you that if you hang in there and, and ask for help of your family, ask for their support, be honest. Um, they love you. They want a doctor in the family. They will do what they need to do once you tell them what you need. And so, yeah, that's what I did. And that's how I balanced that part of medical school. Because until I did that, I wouldn't have made it. Just, it's too hard. It's too hard to, to have two roles, right? The role of medical student and the role of being an important member in your family. So enough yeah. of medical school, enough of that. In life here, what I do very much in, in private, you know, being a, um, a practicing physician, I make time for my family. So for example, I give this to tidbits to everybody who will listen to me. So when you're able to, because your time won't belong to you for a long time, but when you're able to, my husband and I have been married 26 years. And um, we always take off each other's birthdays and we spend it together. Mm -hmm. That's that. We do not work on each other's birthdays. We spend it together. Our anniversary, we always take off and we spend it together. We always plan a you know, week or two of vacation and we plan it way ahead and you do it and you do it. Um, when my son was born until he was about 
when he started school. And Tulu is about sixth grade because then we figured it mattered <laughs> that he was absent. Uh, but up until that point, every birthday he had, we took it off and we mm -hmm. spent it with him. Wherever it was at Knott's Berry Farm or on the beach or at Disneyland or wherever we went with him. But up until he was uh, in middle school, every birthday that he had, we spent it together in his birthday. So you have to be incredibly focused to say these people matter to me and mm -hmm. I'm going to spend time with them and yeah. make sure that you do. And, and the same goes with my dad's birthday, my mother's birthday, my everyone who's got a birthday, I know where they are. And I always make sure on my calendar as I look across a year that I time to make sure that I have the time off so that I can spend that time with them on those yeah. important. And that's what you do. You become very good at investing time in people you love, that you love mm -hmm. and that you want to spend time with. Exactly. So my final question, I love asking this question to everyone is if you could look back, go back in the past, what advice would you give yourself or what advice would you give to other students who are also first gen, going to college, probably going to medical school, what advice would you give them that you wish that you knew now? And I wish that I had then. Mm -hmm. um, know that you are an incredibly resilient, um, strong, dedicated, intelligent, aware human being, and that you need to really understand your, your strengths and believe in them. And that we're not going to be perfect all the time. And we're not going to, you know, we're going to need times where we need help. Reach out, yeah. reach out to your friends. Oh, my friends are amazing. Reach out to your family, let them know what you, what, what you need from them. And half the time, more than half the time, they're going to give that to you. But there will be challenges and there will be struggles throughout the way. But, um, you know, again, it's all about perseverance and knowing that it's a step at a time. And when you need help, just reach out to somebody and say, I need help. Yeah. And they will be there for you um, in droves. So yeah, so yeah, every single one of you there, you you are you are made of this incredible um, material that has already been through struggles and challenges called life. You've experienced mm -hmm. it already. Those challenges that we where we come from, our backgrounds, right? I come from bilingual parents. I was I came here when I was four years old. I didn't know English. Right, me, me primero idioma es español. Tuve que aprender inglés, right? So I had mm -hmm. to be in ASL until the third grade. So you had to get a language for those of us who are from other countries and had to learn the language. But your parents and what you come from, that sturdiness, that foundation, that strength, is what is in you. And don't ever forget it. You come from strength. You mm -hmm. come from exemplary people that have struggled themselves, and you're part of this incredible chain. Um, and you are going to add another one. Um, and hopefully that will be a successful one. So then you can go back and say, who can I help now? Um, mm -hmm. And to realize them that we didn't do this alone. Like I said, it from the very beginning, I didn't do this alone. I did not. There were so many kindred spirits and I like to call them kindred spirits, spirits that lighted the way for me. And if I can be a little, little tiny light for somebody else, then you know what? That's then I've met some of that and I'm getting some of yeah. that. Well, Thank you so much for this amazing interview. Dr. Sosa Johnson, I had such a fun time like meeting with you before, talking to you, hearing everything out. Uh, I really appreciate it so much. Thank you. You're for welcome, Jaden.